Shabbat morning at the biennial has been exclusively reserved for the reflections of the URJ president, but not this year. For this morning's teaching, I have invited our beloved teacher, Rabbi Dr. David Ellenson, to offer the Devar Torah as he concludes 13 years of truly inspired leadership as president of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Rabbi Ellenson exemplifies in one human being all that we cherish, all that we hold sacred. The great Jewish theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel once said, when I was young, I used to admire smart people. As I grow older, I admire kind people. With David Ellenson, we don't have to choose between smart and kind, for God endowed him with brilliance and goodness in equal measures. One of the great privileges of my rabbinic education was the opportunity to be a student in David's first class when he joined the faculty of HUCJAR in Los Angeles. His command of rabbinic sources and the Western intellectual canon is simply dazzling. When the search committee chose David to be the College Institute's 11th president, they knew they were selecting one of the most impressive scholars in the Jewish world. But could they have known the manifold dimensions to David's inspired leadership? David did not have the luxury of leading the college only through seven years of plenty. No, his leadership was tested by the enormous financial pressures brought upon the College Institute and the world by the economic downturn. But like Joseph before him, he found ways to survive the lean years. Students, faculty, donors, and congregants, they all love this erudite scholar who has the gift of relating to each and every one of us with such a full heart and such a full embrace of who we are. Every time David represented our movement at one of the many communal or academic gatherings, he raised the level of respect and honor even our detractors have for us. And in case you think David only raised our intellectual standing, you should also know that he raised a, over a quarter of a billion dollars for the College Institute. And during the Second Intifada, while bombs were exploding cafes and buses, David determined that our movement's future Jewish leaders must not be brought home early to finish their studies in the safety of the stateside campuses. Rabbi Ellenson knew firsthand that Jewish leadership wasn't for the faint-hearted. Israel is in the very marrow of David's being, and so he made that difficult decision to keep the Year in Israel program open that year and to make sure the students never felt abandoned, David spent almost all of that year in Jerusalem with them. Brilliant scholar, consummate mensch, <laughs> prolific fundraiser, passionate Zionist, and lover of the Jewish people only captures a fraction of this larger-than-life man whom we love dearly. When future historians write about this period of Jewish history, Rabbi David Ellenson's indelible impact on the minds and lives of our generation will be featured prominently, but it is not time for that history to be written. For we pray that in the coming years, David, as he returns to the scholarly world that he loves so much full time, there will yet be many, many, many new articles and books ideas that will inspire our entire world. But most importantly, we pray that the coming years will be filled with abundant good health, allowing our teacher more time with his beloved Rabbi Jackie Koch Ellenson and their incredible family. Parashat Vayechi movingly recounts the patriarch Jacob's blessing of the tribes of Israel. Well, the tribes of Reform Judaism are assembled here this morning before our beloved teacher, Jacob gathered his children to hear his words, and as the patriarch Jacob addressed the biblical tribes, 
there are some very complicated emotions and some unresolved tensions, but not here. No, not in our movement, not in this moment, only love and reverence. After the names of revered rabbis, you sometimes hear the acronym Shlita, which stands for She Lirot Yamim Tovim. May he live a good, long life. The patriarch Jacob blesses the tribes at the very end of his life, but not so our beloved Rabbi Dr. David Ellenson Shlita. Thank you enough. It's good to be applauded before you even come up <laughs> to speak. I didn't think I'd start crying quite this quickly. Uh, <laughs> as Rick has put it, he has been a Yadid Nafshi since 1979, in the very first class, I taught at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. He knows me and my wife Jackie and my family extremely, extremely well. We talk quite often to each other. When he was selected as president of the Union for Reform Judaism, I was elated. I am going to relate though a phone call that he gave me, give or take, 10, 12 days ago. Rick knows that in general, I do not write texts. Um, it is difficult for me when I deliver a talk to use a text because in large measure I desire to be present in the moment and when I first became a professor at the College Institute, I had lots and lots and lots of notes. And I found that I did dialogue with my notes very, very well, but it did not mean that I was addressing my students in the dialogue or conversation in which I wished to genuinely engage them. But Rick, in his inimitable style, <laughs> and I am certain that his children have had these kinds of suggestions from him at different points. Susie, I wouldn't even begin to get into what your conversations may have been. Said, you know, it is really, really crucial on this day. I know that in general you don't write talks out, but we would really love to disseminate it later. And as you're probably aware, there are occasions, well, we were talking about it in our staff meeting, and there are occasions when you cry. Um, it might be that if you had a written text, we would both be able to give your words of Torah to the entire movement and the world, which of course is so desperately waiting for these words every second. <laughs> And I just want to tell my friend that Kamoshet Siyarta, as you have commanded, Pakarata Gam Tsayititi, I have done. Uh, I don't know precisely if I'll go by the whole thing, but I even brought <laughs> tissues with me. Uh, he's my mafakade, my commander, and therefore. I obey. I do want to say a couple of other words before I actually begin to speak. Today's service <laughs> has been incredible. Uh, Amichai, if anyone was ever 
properly named it as you, through you our Torah lives in unparalleled ways. And Liz, you were able to have even me move. At one point, at least I was smiling. And then I actually started moving and got into it a little bit. I suppose there is some hope for an old Wissenschaftlich scholar uh, from the 19th century. To Angela Warnick Bookdahl. An incredible cantor, a remarkable rabbi, the rabbi elect, designate as Rabbi Jacobs indicated, our movement will be blessed as she comes to head next summer Central Synagogue in New York. I first met Angela with my wife Jackie, I know precisely when, summer of 1993. Angela was then a student at Yale College. She was a roommate and best friend of Judith Rosenbaum, the daughter of one of my closest friends. And often as I was over there delivering a speech at an academic convocation in Yerushalayim in Beersheba, Angela came with Judith, Jackie, and me. I think we had more than one breakfast on that occasion. And then she went to Women of the Wall. I think it was your first time uh, with Jackie and Judith in 1993. For those of you who don't really know my wife well, she actually is somewhat involved in Women at the Wall. It's uh, an issue uh, in our home. Uh, I take great, great uh, delight, Angela, in all of your accomplishments. The Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, is blessed that it could be your Makom Torah. I will not say more about Rabbi Jacobs now, other than the fact that our movement is truly blessed, that he is the president of our union. On this day, as I mark the end of my term as president of HUCJIR, my thoughts, not surprisingly for those of you who know me, turn to two great figures of the German Jewish past from whom I receive instruction. It is remarkable to me that given my own aspirations in life to study and to teach Torah, that my life took the direction that it did. All I ever genuinely aspired to and why I came to Hebrew Union College and then Columbia University for my doctorate was to study and teach our tradition. I believe with all the fibers of my being that the words of our Torah, Heim Chayenu V'orech Yamenu, Uvahem Negeyo Mam Valayla, we have no tradition, we have no people if in fact we do not honor and study and then ultimately disseminate and teach our literature. It is the foundation, our literature, our Torah, written and oral and beyond what is the classical canon of our tradition that gives shape to our community, that gives us integrity, and that gives us authenticity. In my own life, I hope that on every single day I get to participate in what is a three millennia conversation of Torah, a day does not pass that I do not compel myself to read one, two, or three Hebrew pages of traditional Jewish texts and search them for guidance. And on this day, there are two figures to whom I would turn. One was a rabbi, Yechio Yaakov Weinberg, who lived until 1966, and the other, Rabbi Leo Beck, who lived until 1956. These two men, Rabbi Weinberg and Rabbi Beck were the last two leaders of the last two seminaries in Berlin that were ordaining rabbis to what would soon be a destroyed community. Rabbi Weinberg was an Orthodox scholar. His seminary, the Rabiner Seminar, founded in 1874, was closed on November 10, 1938 
a day that in our history truly is a day of pain, a day of Kristallnacht. Rabbi Weinberg was kept in camps throughout the war and ultimately escaped after being also in the Warsaw Ghetto. He escaped ultimately to Montreux in Switzerland where he lived for the rest of his life. He wrote a work entitled The Cerite Eish, Remnants of the Fire. It is four volumes and it contains hundreds and hundreds of legal opinions and articles. But it is his Hakdama, his introduction, the Sha'ar la Sefer, a part of it that I would cite now. At the very outset of these four volumes, Rabbi Weinberg says that he has, of course, lived through the hell of the Holocaust. And he does not understand why he, unlike so many people he loved and cherished, was allowed to live when others passed away. But he points out that Dean who it is a commandment, it is a law, it is a statute of our tradition that as one begins and one ends a journey, one is commanded to express thanksgiving to God. So on this day, as I begin my words to you, I would thank God Shehechiani, who has kept me in life, Akiyamani, Vahigiani, Lazman Hazeh, who has kept me in life, sustained me, and allowed me to be with my beautiful family to reach this precious day. Rabbi Leo Beck, and I have been known to shed a tear or two when I've discussed Rabbi Beck. Rabbi Beck, of course, was the last duly elected leader of the Jewish community in Germany. It is always meaningful to me that when the Jewish people had to deal with the Nazis and they had to have someone represent them to the German government, a Shiltona Rasha, this evil kingdom, they did not select a businessman. They did not select an attorney. They selected a man of the spirit because they knew that they could trust him and that he would lead them and speak on their behalf more effectively and more caringly than anyone else. He, of course, was incarcerated in Teresian. Three of his sisters died there. And at the end of his work, when he did manage to survive, three years later he published a book entitled This People Israel. It is, in my mind, the greatest spiritual theological history of the Jewish people ever written. At the very end of his book, Rabbi Beck utters words which have been always emblazoned on my heart. He says that persons are not born into community as if by fate, but we are called by God to the task of molding community. We are not born into community as if by fate, but God calls upon us to be shutafim, partners with God in the world that is about to unfold and be created. At this moment of thanksgiving, in response to the teachings of Rabbi Weinberg and Rabbi Beck, and before I turn to the parasha, or at least one episode in it itself, I want to talk about how, from my own personal perspective, this movement, the reform movement, has given shape and direction to my life. So that my life has not, I hope and I feel, been one marked by fate, but one marked by a community that together with you and with so many others, together we in the reform movement have been able to form. What I am about to give you is not in my farewell address as president of the College Institute to this great assembly, is not an attempt to give you bullet points 
about why the reform movement is so precious and so holy. It is my attempt to tell you why in my life this movement and the College Institute as part of it have informed me in each and every way and I hope that as I speak that as all of you consider what the future of this movement and its place in Klal Yisrael among the community of Israel will be, that you will come to understand how incredibly precious your Yerusha, your legacy, your heritage is, your Nachala, as Reformed Jews. So in this time of memory and this time of thanksgiving, I want to talk about how I have arrived at this day. I was not born into the reform movement. I was not raised in the reform movement. I frankly knew nothing about the reform movement and the little bit I did know as a young man was essentially pejorative. I knew it was anti-Zionist or at least I had been told it was and that the reform movement did not take tradition very seriously. But at the age of 21, after I graduated from the College of William and Mary and felt alienated and distanced from what I regarded as the strictures, the unnecessary strictures, the lack of commitment to social issues in the world in which I had been raised, I was embraced and welcomed by a rabbi and his wife in Roanoke, Virginia. The rabbi then was Donald Berlin. And in light of what Rabbi Jacob said earlier in his very kind words of introduction, Rabbi Berlin brought me into the reform movement along with Norma because at a time when all I felt Deep in my soul was agmas nefesh, was anguish over what I regarded as the rejection and the problems in the Judaism in which I had been raised. He performed a simple act of kindness. He opened the door, taught, and welcomed me in to his temple and his community. I've cherished my relationship with him since 1969. Several years later, I entered the Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. I was blessed there to study Talmud with an incredible figure, the Associate Dean Professor Michael Klein. I was able to sit with Michael, study texts, and learned that there was a richness of our tradition in which we had to be anchored so that we could go out into the world. And it was taught with intelligence and with unbelievable erudition. A year later, my friend Rabbi Robert Lowy was the one responsible in every practical level for introducing me to the reform movement. At the end of my year in Israel, Robert said, Bob said, I don't know anyone ever called him Robert, uh, his mother probably. Bob said, you've got to come to Camp Eisner. I had never been to a Jewish camp. In fact, I had never been to any camp. And there I experienced the living Judaism. I did make a discovery which from my Orthodox background I'm not even certain if I can fully capture anthropologically how distant this was from anything I had experienced. There was, I discovered there, a phenomenon that I would just simply label the cult of the song leader. (laughs) I had never witnessed a song leader. Shabbat came, that very first Shabbat I was there. Louis Dobin, Jeff Klepper, I remember Elise Frischman, 
some young group called Colbus Seder with a fellow named Danny Friedlander in it. Some of you may remember. And I thought, you know what, this movement really isn't so bad. <laughs> Weird, but not bad. <laughs> Several years later, I was able to serve as a rabbi at Community Synagogue in Port Washington, New York under Martin Rosenberg. <laughs> I have friendships and connections from that year to this day. Bob and Amy Heller, the current rabbi, Erwin Zeplowitz, and many, many more people. The CCAR was a source of incredible, incredible joy to me. One of my closest, closest friends, indeed the godparents of our son Rafi, Karen Fox, and her husband Mickey Rosen, who held Rafi at his bris. Karen's baby brother, Rabbi Steve Fox, now leads our movement as the chief executive of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. And I first came to know Rabbi Rick Block, the president of our conference, through service on a nominating committee of the Central Conference of American Rabbis as a teacher at the College Institute, how much my students taught me. I remember very well in the summer of 1980 or 81 teaching in the School of Jewish Communal Service and there was a retreat. And late, on an informal way, discussion on a Saturday night, Jane Fantel, Andy Rose, Sandy Bogan, made me conscious of an issue of which I was totally ignorant. They described what it was to be gay and lesbian, the pain of exclusion, the pain of discrimination, the hurt they felt by not being able to express their whole personhood in public. Mikom alum Kalti, I've tried to learn from all my teachers, from my students more than anyone, to Jane, to Andy, to Sandy, I learned incredibly, incredibly crucial lessons about human dignity and equality and the commitments that I've tried to demonstrate to LGBTQ rights in our world stem directly from an informal conversation very late at night at a Jewish communal service retreat. To Congregation Rodef Sholem in New York, my congregation. Some of you must be here. My friend of 40 years, Rabbi Robert Levine, who was the Masadir Kiddushin, when Jackie and I were married, it was at that congregation that Rabbi David Saperstein introduced, guided, and inspired a young girl, Jackie Koch, who became president of the youth group at Rodef Sholem, while David served as assistant rabbi and youth group director. I don't know what's happened to him in the years since, <laughs> but I would thank him tonight. To all of you who are here, what Rick could not possibly capture, nor could I, for over 20, 30 years of my life, I have been guests in your homes, in your congregations. You have given me the privilege of not only teaching Torah to those who have been your cantors, your rabbis, your educators, your communal workers, your scholars, but you have let me teach in your communities and you have hosted me in your homes. You have walked with me along this path for more than 30 years, and to all of you who are here today, in that sense, I say thank you to you. To Rabbi Eric Yaffe, his integrity and steadfast loyalty has inspired and it undergirded me throughout what were the most difficult years in this office. He was the most worthy successor to Rabbi Alexander Schindler, 
when I would attend these biennials and indeed anywhere I was, when I would hear Rabbi Schindler speak and later Rabbi Yaffe, I would be proud to be a Reformed Jew. They uplifted and inspired my souls. They gave direction to our people in ways that make me so proud of what it is that this movement is about. How is it that you can fully capture what a movement like this is? I know, Rick, that it is crucial that we have the right public relations and that we get our message across. And I know that tweet is significant, or tweeting. I'm actually not very good at this. Uh, I'm not even on Facebook. Uh, but I know these things are crucial. But what I am trying to convey to you today, relationships, 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 being in people's presence, hearing them, listening to them, whether through the internet or through any other way, but being in their presence. How could I ever thank this movement enough for everything this movement has given to me? To my beloved friend, Rabbi Jacobs, you lead us with such passion and insight. You are a blessing to our people. There are so many people at the College Institute I could and should thank, but I will limit it to two. To Rabbi Norman Cohen and to Rabbi Michael Marmer, who served as provost of the College Institute during my years as president, no one could have had better partners to inspire and direct our faculty as we attempt to educate your leaders today and for tomorrow than Norman and Michael. And to my precious successor, Rabbi Aaron Pankin. You may become one of those people, Aaron, where every time I mention your name, I cry, but we'll see. <laughs> I'd like to say it's a short list, but. <laughs> your talents are so many, and your devotion to our people, to our faith, to the task of educating future Jewish leaders is so immense. To you and to your beloved Lisa, I express special gratitude as you will come in 17 days as you and I are both counting uh, to take this position. And now I will try to read this. To my partner, My best, my most trusted, my most candid, my most honest, and my most critical, but also my most supportive friend, Rabbi Jacqueline Koch Ellenson. On our ketubah, we wrote words from Shir Hashirim, Matsati et Sha'ahava Nafshi. I found the one whom my soul loves. Words cannot capture what you mean to me. I don't know, to see you here today and every day with Micah, with Sarah, with Lily. Thank you. And now let me turn to the Torah itself. I hope I've been teaching a kind of Torah in these first minutes. In this week's parsha, by Echi, there is a plethora of blessings. As we've seen, Jacob on his deathbed gathers all his children around him and offers each a blessing, an admonition, a comment, a shtoch. I will return to that scene in a few moments at the end of my remarks today, but now I want to focus specifically on Genesis 47, which contains one of the most poignant scenes in the Torah. As Sefer Breshit concludes, Immediately prior to bringing all of his sons, 
And we don't want to leave out Dina now. Anita Diamond, capture that. Jacob brings Joseph's sons, his grandsons, Jacob's grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh, to his father's bedside. And I want to read to you this passage in the Torah. It is one of the most powerful and one of the most poignant passages in all of Jewish literature. Joseph, his father has feared, has been killed. And what is it that he discovers? That his son Joseph is still in life, a dying chai, od chai. And now at the end of his days, Jacob sits at his deathbed. And Joseph enters the room with two boys. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, he asked me, Ela, who are these? And Joseph said to his father, these are my sons whom God has given me here. And then Jacob said, Bring them to me that I may bless them. Israel's eyes had grown clouded with age. He could no longer see. And Joseph brought these boys over to him. And the text says, He kissed them and he hugged them. And Israel then said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again. And here God has shown me Zarecha, your seed as well. Imagine for a moment, any of you who is a parent and any of you who are a child here, and that should include everyone, what it would mean to think that your child had died, that you would never see your child again. that you would never see your father or your mother again. And then suddenly you discover that your son has become the king of Egypt. And he brings you then not only himself, but he brings you his grandchildren. And at that point then, Joseph removed the boys from before his father's knees. And what is it that Joseph does? He bows down before his father to the ground. And then Joseph took the two boys, Ephraim the younger with his right hand, to Israel's left as we saw in the picture, still there. And Manasseh the elder with his left hand to Israel's right, and he brought them close to him. But Israel stretched out his right hand, as is depicted in the picture, and placed it on Ephraim's head, even though he was the younger. And he put his left hand on Manasseh's head. Crossing his arms, though Manasseh was the firstborn. And he then blessed Joseph, as Amichai pointed out today, through these boys, saying, The God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, the God who has shepherded me since I came into being until this day, Hamalach Goeloti Mikol Ra, the angel who rescues me from all harm as a boy. When I would do Kriya Shema, Alamita, when I would recite the Shema before bedtime, these are the lines I would recite. Bless these lads. Through them let my name and the name of my fathers ever be recalled. V'yid gularov b'kerev ha'aretz. And let them greatly multiply within the land. For those of you interested in classical reform Judaism, the very first confirmation ceremony held at the Hamburg Temple in the 19th century cited this line as the prayer to be recited over the boys and girls when they were confirmed in Hamburg in the 1800s. And when Joseph saw that his father had placed his right hand on Ephraim's head, it seemed wrong to him. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head onto the head of Manasseh, Joseph says explicitly to his father, not this way, Abba, not this way, Daddy. This one, Manasseh, is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. 
And so we bless them that day saying, and these are the words we use to bless our boys all the way to the present day. Yesimcha Elohim ke'afrayim uchim menasha. May God bless you. May God make you like Ephraim and Menasha. And he put Ephraim before Menasha. The Meforshim, our commentators on this verse, have asked question after question. Why is it that Jacob reversed this order? Why is it that Israel offered the blessing of the right hand to the younger son Ephraim and the blessing of the left hand to the elder son Manasseh over the explicit objections of his son Joseph. The answers are legion. But there is one commentary offered by Hermann Cohen, the famed philosopher of classical reform Judaism, in his work, The Religion of Reason Out of the Sources of Judaism. I expect you to all go out and buy it now. And I would build upon and cite it today for I believe it provides an answer to the direction in which our movement moves. And it should is an important lesson to all of us during this time of transition and change. Professor Cohen, building upon the medieval commentators, the medieval Meforshim and their perushim on this passage, points out that throughout the book of Bereshit, conflict is constant. Brothers and sisters always fight. They hate one another. They kill one another. It is as if throughout the entire book there is never Shefa Brachot. There is never enough blessing. Say something nice about A, it must mean that I am somehow diminished. There is never enough blessing. There is always triage with my son Micah as the only child here, Lily is the only grandchild, occasionally with five children, our children will say to us, why did you do X for this child and not for me? And Jackie and I have learned after all these years there is only one good answer. We just tell that particular child who's complaining, well, we love your sister or brother better. Uh, <laughs> That actually means whatever answer we would give would never be enough. <laughs> but note what the Book of Bereshi teaches. Conflict is a law of life. Cain kills his brother Abel. Isaac and Ishmael, their mothers, Sarah and Hagar, are in a state of constant conflict with one another. Ishmael taunts Isaac and Abraham finally, in order to achieve shalom bayit, peace in his home, has to send Hagar and Ishmael away. Rebecca helps her son Jacob cheat her other son Esau out of his birthright. And they fool Jacob's father, Isaac. Leah has a naim rakot. She has weak eyes. And the commentators point out why are her eyes weak? Because she is constantly crying in one interpretation. Because her husband, Jacob, loves her sister more than he loves her. And then think of Joseph and his brothers. His brothers dislike him so much they sell him into slavery. The whole book of Bereshit, our ancestors, it is one good, big, happy, dysfunctional family. <laughs> Here I think of the New Yorker cartoon where it shows one person in an auditorium larger than this, and then there's the sign up at top, convention of people from functional families. <laughs> Not true in this room, but in others. The book of Genesis suggests that this is the way the world is. Rivalry, jealousy, conflict, anger, struggle, they are constants. Combat and hostility are seemingly unavoidable. And then comes this chapter in our parsha where Jacob blesses his grandchildren, Ephraim and Manasseh. Israel had despaired of ever seeing his son Joseph again. Israel had surrendered hope. 
and now at the very end of his life, as he lies on his deathbed, a miracle has occurred. He has an opportunity to bless not only Joseph, but Ephraim and Manasseh as well. And rather than blessing Manasseh with the blessing of the right hand, that was Manasseh's right as the eldest son, Jacob chooses to bless the younger Ephraim with the right hand and places his left hand in blessing over the elder brother Manasseh. It is a situation that is designed to foster conflict. There can be seemingly no other outcome. Yet, as Herman Cohen points out, what is remarkable about this passage is that no conflict results. There is no tale of struggle between the brothers. They live in love and harmony with one another. And I would suggest, as Herman Cohen did years ago, that the brothers of Ephraim and Menashe grasp instinctively the lesson that their grandfather Jacob wishes to teach them, even as their own father Joseph does not. For Jacob, at the end of his life, finally comes to understand there is a Shefa Brachot, an abundance of blessing in the world. The world not be, need not be seen as one of triage, a zero-sum game where blessing for one means deprivation for the other. Ephraim and Manasha understand that there is sufficient blessing for them, for both of them, and through their conduct, their love for one another, they indicate how the world ought to be, that brothers and sisters ought to live in harmony and tolerance and love and caring and kindness with one another, that the way the world ought to be is in fact the way the world is. This is the vision that our religion and our movement ultimately have of existence. Conflict is all too often present. It mars life. Yet our Torah teaches us through this parasha that the world need not and cannot surrender to such a Hobbesian vision of a world marked by a struggle of all against all. The world is capable, the world is capable of tikkun, of restoration and repair. Brothers and sisters can treat one another with respect and love. This is the mitzvah, the divine imperative that lies at the heart of our tradition. It is the ethos that animates our movement. When we recite the words, Yasim Cha Elohim Ke Ephraim Uchi Menasha, may God make you as Ephraim and Menasha, we are expressing the hope and the confidence that through our actions, God can be present in a world where the model of love and devotion to one another, as established by Ephraim and Menasha, can be realized. This lesson lies at the heart of our religious vision. And it is this hope that is repeated on every occasion when we bless our sons. The book of Genesis is only able to come to an end when the way the world ought to be, that brothers and sisters can love and forgive one another, is the way the world is. Rabbi Pesner reminded of this, reminded us of this so eloquently and sensitively last night when we celebrated and we recalled the life of Nelson Mandela, for who embodied this message more perfectly than President Mandela. In concluding my remarks, I want to offer one more teaching inspired by Amichai today. We recite the word Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, twice, perhaps three times daily, depending on your tradition. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Of course, when I translate Adonai as Lord, I think of my colleague, Tamara Eskenazi, who used to charge all the students, maybe she still does, either a quarter or a dollar that has to be given to tzedakah for using such gendered language. Um, it's a habit from my childhood. It's hard for me to break it. Of course, it's a declaration. The people Israel is firm, as we did today, that Adonai is our God and Adonai is one, as Rabbi Jacob so brilliantly taught us today. But there is a rabbinic midrash 
and Amichai alluded to it today, and I would conclude with it, that the Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel, is not a declaration to the entire people of Israel. Rather, it is a statement made by Jacob's children, sons and daughter, to him at the end of his life at this moment. They say, listen, Shema Yisrael, hear our father Israel. Adonai is our God and Adonai is one. We affirm your traditions. We affirm your community. We affirm your faith. As we reach out into the larger world and attempt to embrace a Judaism of joy and inclusion, we have to remember that we are still anchored in a Nachala, a Yerusha, an inheritance that gives our community a sense of boundaries, that gives our community a sense of meaning. And according to the tradition and in classical halacha, if one were in an Orthodox congregation when you recite the Shema, the Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad is recited out loud. But the second line, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto, Leolam Va'ed, praised be the name of God's glorious kingdom forever and ever, is recited either silently or in a whisper. Because according to this rabbinic tradition, when Jacob's children say to him, Hear Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. Jacob, Israel, is able to feel a sense of sipuk nefesh, of contentment, of satisfaction, because the tradition that he loves and that he has affirmed is going to be carried forth by his children in their own unique and distinct and inspired and inspiring ways in their own ways into the world. So it is Jacob who recites the words as he dies, praise be the name of God's glorious kingdom forever and ever. As president of the College Institute, I have been blessed with an incredible zechut, an incredible privilege. The ability to stand at the head of our Beit Midrash that educates such incredible leaders for our people is a unique, unique blessing. Isaac Mayer Wise had a vision when he created the Central Conference of American Rabbis the Union of American Hebrew Congregations and the Hebrew Union College, that without inspired, intelligent, and inspiring leadership, the Jewish people could not prosper and survive in this continent or throughout the world. The direction of the College Institute is bound by the past, as is our movement, but our ways wind and wander as well. And for 138 years, the College Institute has attempted to educate persons like those I mentioned today to lead and guide you. We remain true to what is an enduring vision. And we try to create leaders who will inspire you to aid God in this task of repairing the world, this message of our parasha, that the way the world ought to be is in fact the way the world can be. And at this moment, as I step away from the presidency of the College Institute, I am filled as Jacob, our father, Yaakov Avinu, Yisrael Avinu was, with tremendous confidence and with tremendous hope. Because I know, just as Jacob did, that our movement and our people through the conference, through the union, through all the organizations of this movement, could not be in better hands. And the institution that has forged my life now for more than 40 years is truly in gifted hands. And so it is in light of the spirit of this teaching, in gratitude to you, to this reform movement, for all you mean, for all you have done through your camps, through your kalot, through the Religious Action Center, 
through the work of our rabbis, canners, educators, administrators, that I express gratitude to you once again and recite fully the blessing, Baruch Atah Anai Eloheinu Melech Olam, Shehechayanu V'kiyamanu V'higiyanu Lazman Hazeh. And I would like to call up, if I can be Jacob for a moment, my beloved friend and successor, Rabbi Aaron Pankin, where in your presence I offer the blessing that Jacob offered to his grandchildren and the spirit that Jacob offered that blessing before Aaron on this occasion. It is 17 days, Aaron, Before you assume fully this position, you do know I will always be there whenever it is you need me. That I promise you. But in the way that I have tried to describe this parasha today, what I do say to you, my colleague, my student, my friend, Yasim Khalim Kefraim Ochimanasha, may God regard you as Ephraim and Manasha were regarded. May you help through your leadership of this college institute to continue that shalshelet Kabbalah that has produced leaders who engage in this tikkun of which Jacob dreamed. And then in words that are recited, Kotevarachu et b'nei Yisrael, with these words we bless the children of Israel. To you, Aaron, in front of this community. Ata'ish asher ruach bo, you are a person in whom there is as God instructed Moses when he selected Joshua, you are a person in whom there is a proper spirit. And so to you, Aaron, a child of this movement and of everything that is good in it, I pray that God always blesses you and keeps you. I pray that God's countenance always shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up his face to you, your beloved Lisa, to Eli, to Sam. And through your leadership, may you help to create a world that is shalem, ever more complete, a world that is ever more repaired, a world that not only is, but can become truly what it ought to be. And for this, I bless you with peace. Amen. Rabbi Aaron Pankin, President-elect of the Hebrew Union College. Rabbi, it is, there are always abundant blessings. We do not, we know they do not run out. You give them to us every day. We want to have an opportunity to bless you and your beloved wife, Jackie, Rabbi Ellenson. And so I invite us actually to all rise. And this blessing we heard already from the Parsha is a blessing that the angels will watch over you. And we actually all have, some of us have wings today. So if you have your talit and you can actually spread it over those around you, it will actually connect us because part of the gift that you've given us is a sense of that unity. Oh, yes. Come on up. Micah, come on up, too. And we'll bless you with these words. Hamalach 
And we continue with the Alenu prayer. Alenu le shabe achladon hakol la teit gedula liot ser breishi shelo asanu kagoye haratzot velo samanu kamishvachot adama. Shelosam Helkenu Kahem, Vegoralenu Kehol Hamonam, Vanachnu Korim, Umishtahabim, Umodim, Lifne Melech, Malche Hamlachim, Hakadosh Baru. Bayom ha'hu, bayom ha'hu, yie Adonai echad. Ushemu, ushemu, ushemu echad. Keep your hands there. Thank you. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. 